Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to day five of uh, Acre Webinar Week. I'm here together with Rob. Hi, Rob. How are you? Hi, buddy. Hey. So, Rob, this is going to be a very special one because, Rob, you're in a bar, aren't you? Yes, I am in Amsterdam, Bar Mokum. Bar Mokum, and uh, we're going to do some cool stuff. But let me let me start introducing uh, the what we're doing today. So today we're going to. Uh, be together with Rob, and Rob is a specialist trainer uh, in bartending, mixology, barista, and tea. Well, so we consider tea, we consider barista, but we decided to go for straight alcohol in the early morning, right, Rob? That's what we're doing today. And absolutely, uh, absolutely. So uh, I'm here. Uh, Joanna is with us, and uh, what we're doing today is talking about the key element of mixed drinks. We're doing even more than this. We sent you a nice little email on Friday, and uh, I see a lot of people already talking about tequila, tequila. Uh, as Galina saying, that's almost midday in uh, in Finland. Um, Lawrence got a bottle of tequila ready. Um, yes, Abby, it's midday somewhere, but the Brits normally don't mind that much, so we should be fine. I'm heading it over to you, Rob. Let me know when you need any slides. And guys, enjoy this session very much, and uh, let's make some beautiful cocktails. Thank you very much, Arnold. Um Actually, we have a screen waiting for us um, um, uh, for the introduction. So, no, please, so let's start with the first slide, and I'll explain uh, what we're going to do. And obviously tell you a little bit more about myself uh, and uh, yeah, the, the cool stuff we're going to do for the next 45 minutes to uh, one hour. So key elements of mixed drinks. Uh, I've lined up seven um, different uh, categories basically on the success elements of mixed drinks. Then instantly we're going to make the drink that you see in the screen as well, which is called a Noma. It's a tequila long drink or a tequila highball. And we're going to make our own freshly uh, fresh brewed lemonade. Um, when we have our drink, I'm going to talk about uh, tequila, a little bit about the history, and especially advise you some more on uh, what to, to, to get to stock basically on board uh, um, and to tell you more about the descriptions about uh, tequila. Then tequila in mixed drinks and then mixology. Mixology is really the wine of mixed drinks, not the how. I mean, everybody can read and uh, execute a recipe, but if we look to mixology guides, guidelines, I hope to give you more insights on uh, to create that perfect uh, cocktail. So before we kick it off uh, with the uh, the success factors of mixed drink, my name is Rob Rademaker, Rob Rademaker, sorry. Um, I'm almost spelled my own name uh, wrong. <laughs> Rob maker uh born and raised in amsterdam uh i started uh 17 years ago roughly in hospitality from dishes to being a butler in five-star hotels um to uh, uh working as a chef uh, as a bartender did loads of cool stuff one of those things is that i worked for an international brand uh traveling the world for seven years doing education on bartending then i came back to amsterdam and actually after working with a new uh, with a few more bars uh, I joined the luxury hospitality team uh, roughly three years ago, uh, and today uh, I'm so happy to do this seminar, especially because we are far, far away, but thank God we have the technique, and thank God we have the product uh, available for this session. So uh, how about we start with the first slide? I have a very high-tech way of uh, showing that we go to the next slide, which is like uh, that. So let's uh, wait until the slide is there. Oh no. Slide is on the seven hello, key hello. elements. Yeah, slide is on the seven key elements of mixing drinks. Yes, let me follow that as well. I also have another secondary screen here. So let me start with the first one, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Correct glasses. All right, a glass really showcases the product. Um, the same thing that when you go out, you go to a bar, you make sure you have a nice outfit on. The glass is the outfit. Make sure it's of of proper quality clean room temperature obviously the garnish is another outfit that we see uh, with the drinks but first of all really take care of your glasses and think of mindsets because glasses with round sides they might psychologically let you already think that the drink that you're going to drink will be round in flavor as well right we have a sharper glass like a martini glass this is really your operative style type of glass or psychologically 
the shape of the glass already creates an experience and creates flavor in the drink. So the next step is your ice. Um, here in Holland, uh, people like to get their money's worth, <laughs> if you know what I mean. That means in Holland they say, well, leave out the ice or just one ice cube because then the rest of the glass can be full uh, with liquid to, to, to drink, obviously. Uh, the thing is, when you take the glass and you have one or two ice cubes in there, they, will they don't chill, chill, chill the drink very, very uh, good. Why? Because just those two ice drink, uh, cubes need to keep the drink cold uh, and will start diluting super fast. So in a short period of time, we get loads of water. So basically what we want to do is fill this puppy up all, with, all the way with ice. So you have lots of power um, so the drink doesn't melt as fast. So it stays colder longer. Also, the ice that you use, you can play around with this. It's very nice to have like the ice spheres, like the ice balls. Uh, you, you can get a silicone tray for this, also for the big cubes. And the ice cubes you use on board, make sure they do not have the hole on the inside of the cube, right? I'm just getting this with my fingers right now. So it's nice that we are in a bar. This is a Hoshi Zaki ice cube. It's the brand. But basically what you see, it is all the way solid. Okay, when I'm taking, uh, oh, thanks, uh, Ono. It's always solid. So uh, when you do have an ice machine and it has a hole inside, make sure to clean the filter properly and then you'll have uh, the, the, the solid ice again, right? So a good drink, you eat good ice and lots of it. All right, next point freshly squeezed juices. Uh, don't try to buy imitation lime juice or lemon juice or stuff like this. Because, uh, yes, you can keep it much longer compared with the fresh stuff, but it's two different ballparks. I think uh, we're speaking the same language on the fresh ingredients. Uh, then decent, correct brands of liquor, liqueurs and sodas. Uh, when you use a soda, don't go for the cheap stuff, which is made by big multinational companies. Try to look to smaller brands like, uh, you know, I have here a London Essence or Fever Tree. Uh, these are pretty high quality. If you use Schweppes, let's say you make a gin and tonic, the Schweppes tonic is just mass produced and as cheap as possible with chemical compounds in there, which you don't want to do basically. So when you use sodas, make sure uh, the quality is good. Same goes for the spirits and the liqueurs. Um, consistent recipes, first of all, consistent. When you make a drink for a guest on Friday, it should be the same on Monday as well, right? That's why we have recipes, guidelines within within our service team, um, and obviously correct technique. I will show you two techniques today, uh, but the technique has a major impact on uh, the final flavor of the drink. Let's go to the next topic, which is uh, attractive edible garnishes and fresh. Um, some people that put like flamingos inside in Christmas trees and they try to make as much as garnishes as possible. Guys, less is more, right? Keep it simple. Uh, the KISS principle, use that one, yeah? Uh, I'm just checking the screen uh, all the time. So uh, clean as you go. Obviously, we want to work safe and hygienically. Uh, but, but while if you work clean, if you work safe, that means you have efficiency. If you combine, combine that with speed, we have a, uh, this is a very key element when making drinks. So these are the seven points that we're going to follow and we're going to uh, use this as a backup during uh, the next, um, the next uh, few minutes. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Uh, and then I'll explain you the uh, drink that we're going to make, which is the Paloma. A Paloma is invented by a bartender. Uh, his last name, <laughs> believe it or not, is Corona. Um, and he created a drink with, with which basically a Cuba Libre. And a Cuba Libre is uh, rum, coke, lime. Serve that in a long glass. Serve it with a smile. Yeah. What he did, he took out the rum, put in some tequila, uh, lime in there with coke and a salt rim. Later, the Coca-Cola was... Um, uh, was changed for a grapefruit soda, which have many brands of and which we're going to make fresh. Um, in the previous slides at the welcome uh, screen, I actually had two icons, which I didn't explain you yet. One of them is uh, a pen and paper. If you got stuff that you want to uh, ask or know or tips that I give you, please write them down. Uh, one thing you could write down as well, uh, is the uh, Paloma recipe as I'm explaining about it, okay? Um, the other one is we have a text 
second. So if you have questions, just pop them in or not let me know. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions that you have for me. So first of all, I, does everybody have a bottle of tequila on the bar or somewhere near your uh, desk? I think so. What we need for this drink is the tequila. You can use any type of tequila you want. I'm going to go with a reposado tequila. Um, there you go. Then, thanks, Ono. I'm going for the reposado tequila, which is a little bit, it has some more aging, it's a little softer. Then, uh, we're going to add the grape uh, fruit juice. Ono, can you go back, please, so people can see the recipe also? I'll just go through the ingredients. People can set the uh, ingredients down, and then I'll show you how to make a drink. So, then the next one is a freshly squeezed, sorry, grapefruit juice, it's already there. Lime juice, already pre-squeezed. And then sweetness to taste. I'm using agave syrup, you can use honey, you can use sugar syrup. So I hope everybody wrote it down. I'm just going to show you uh, the drink. So can we go back to big screen, please? I have a, maybe you can hear it. I have a little particular song, everybody. That's, we need to have some music. Cool. Step number one, we take the glass. Then we throw in some tequila, 40 milliliters. Goes in your long drink glass. There you go. Goes in there, close the bottle, put it back where we found it. Next step is 15 ml of a lime juice, freshly squeezed. Obviously, we're making this drink, so we have something to drink while I talk about um, tequila, the wonderful spirit of Mexico. 60 ml, if I'm right, if I'm right of freshly squeezed pink baked grapefruit juice. Just like that. And a little more. So basically, now we have our base. We have tequila in there, um, which is sour. If you don't like sugar in your drinks, that's fine. Um, and don't use it. I love when it has a little sweet and sour balance. So I'm just going to do just by feeling just a touch of uh, the agave syrup in there. Then what we can do, taste with a straw how the, the, the balance is. If you like it, you can still tweak it. That's lovely. Now we're going to roll it. Soda, we're going to use also as an ingredient. Oh, that's really good, by the way. Good morning, everybody. Um, the soda uh, has lots of bubbles, so when we're going to mix everything now, um, we will lose the bubble. So I ask you to take two long drinks. One of them, hold it up high in the air, so I'll wait for everybody to do that. Hold one glass high, and then I'm going to pour in the other glass, but we're going to let it roll down, yeah? So why do we do that? Because we want to aerate the mixture, but don't put a lot of water as well to it. So we're just going to pour it down and pull it. You get small foam on there with oxidation. It's super, <clears throat> sorry, that goes my voice. It's super important that you oxidize or aerate fresh ingredients. Why? Because you really activate a lot of flavor in the drink. One more time. So we mix it. Next step, ice. It's really important. Loads of it, good chunks in the glass. There you go. And the next step basically is soda water. The main difference between soda water and regular sparkling water is that soda water has much higher intensity and uh, much higher concentration of those bubbles. And when you're mixing those ingredients, that the bubbles stay alive and you create really the mouthfeel in your drink. It's a really refreshing, nice, long drink. Let me take away the other ingredients. You can see what I'm doing. There you go, Paloma. You can add a pinch of salt if you want. I'm just going to leave it like this. Get myself a grapefruit slice. I'm going to cut it on the bar so you can see what I'm doing. There you go. Take a big grapefruit, cut it in half. There you go. There we have the insides, nice and red, nice and fresh. And then we're going to cut a wedge. Basically, a wedge is cut like a pizza slice, yeah? Just put it down in a small angle. There you go, make a cut. That looks super fresh and amazing. Just 
slide it into the glass, and Bob's your uncle. Yeah? Cool. Hello. So I hope everybody's there. I'm going to uh, turn on the music, and I want to just make a, a quick toast to everybody who is hanging in there. And uh, hopefully this session will uh, give you a little bit more light and fun uh, with this current situation. So cheers to that, everybody. Oops, uh, for ob obviously working with AQ and Luxury Hospitality. And I think it's time to start the actual session. So salute, cheers. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please, Ono. Let's just wait until the slide is on. Yeah, so let's speak a little bit about the um, about the myths about tequila. Um, obviously, when you think about tequila, it's like, have you hugged your toilet today? People drinking too much. Um, it's the drink that shows up in the end of the night, at least 10 of them. Uh, and people will feel very uh, hungover the next day. Will tequila make you hungover? Well, actually, good tequila uh, it doesn't give you a lot of hangover. We know the Lion King, obviously Hakuna Matata. Uh, we'd look to Hakuna Tequila. Uh, it meets no memories for the rest of your night. Well, basically, uh, with bad tequila, guys, and also if you drink a lot of alcohol, you're going to forget a lot anyways, right? Uh, there is a lot of myth. It's made from a cactus, and a cactus should have poison, so tequila will make you crazy. Uh, not true. It's not made from a cactus. It's actually made from a desert lily called the agave plant. Uh, there's another myth which has the, the worm. Should tequila have a worm inside? No, that's his sister or brother. It's called mezcal. And mezcal is a different type of agave distillate. Uh, and uh, just only a few brands, they add the worm, or as they call it in Mexico, the cusano uh, inside. So why should you add animals or a worm in a bottle? Uh, well, actually, back in the old days, there's uh, there's two stories. Story number one is that they will show you that the the product is of high alcohol by taking the larvae or the caterpillar. It's actually a caterpillar that grows on the agave plants or the cocoons, basically becomes a night butterfly. Um, and they would take a live one, throw it into a, the bottle because back in the old days you didn't have alcohol meters. So what they would do is uh, throw the larvae in and wait until it uh, dies out very fast. Uh, and when it's kept, kept on being alive, you know, there's low alcohol percentage because it could survive, right? So the other one is basically you just check the bottle where the, uh, the larvae is still the freshest, looks the best, because then you also know it is a high alcohol percentage. So it's a, a very a prehistoric alcohol meter, basically, the Cusano. Uh, inside the bottle. And tequila, you don't find it, okay? It doesn't make you crazy. It doesn't really flavor the product. It's just there as a gimmick, okay? Um, let's go to the uh, to the next slide, please. The cool thing about tequila, it has, has so many uh, thoughts and so many myths, uh, but probably what you didn't know is that it comes from a plant, which is not a cactus. It is actually a desert lily. Uh, there's just one time per year these plants get water. I see Ono in the screen. Ono, do you have a question? I have a question. Thank you for noticing. Um, Galina is asking, yeah. you have to wo the warm. Eh? I want to go back to the warm and the bottle of uh, mezcal. Eh? Yeah. What do you do uh, <laughs> during yeah. service if it falls into the glass? Uh, you can do a few things. Uh, you can just get a fork and eat it yourself in front of the guests. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> Uh, the other one, you can just make 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 a joke about it. Uh, basically, uh, when we make mistakes during service, um, it's all about creating that fun factor, right? That 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 service that people will memorize. So the worm is a very nice tool to have a laugh with the guest. Uh, so when it falls outside of the bottle, um, yeah, just come up with a cool story uh, and either just eat it yourself in front of the guest. I would say. <laughs> doesn't Thank give you, you any harm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it's a cool gimmick. It's a cool gimmick. Welcome, welcome. Um, so, yeah, tequila it comes from a plant, um, as I said. And this plant, believe it or not, has to grow at least seven years to roughly 12 years um, before it can be harvested. Then you need to ferment it, then distill it, and then you can even put it into a barrel. So that whole toilet hugging story, like, okay, 
seven years at least yes uh the plant gets um uh water once a year it's super hot during the day so it's a really tough tough plant and it actually comes from uh, which, uh on the top, top left screen you see a small map there is a few regions in mexico that you can make tequila the main region or the largest one is uh jalisco uh, and there's a town called tequila um the ancient aztecs the indian tribes they uh, spoke about the word tequila where it came from uh, and actually it, it, uh, we have two stories story number one is not so it's a little bit dull story that the word actually means place of work or where a place where they could um uh, and, uh have got uh, rituals to to set make sacrifices to the gods and uh, so that's what the name tequila is tequila comes from the other one uh probably is much more uh, uh fun to tell your guests as well uh i put a picture here which is the volcano which is in the uh, close to tequila and they call it um um the silla which basically means uh sorry i got the spelling wrong i had it in my notes but it's i'll get back to that could you just check my notebook Basically, but uh, what it means, tesia or te temia. Ah, oh, sorry, it's it's temia. Um, it means small woman breasts. When you look to the mountains in the back, it's actually two small breasts. So temia, tequila. I probably probably go with that story to tell everybody. So uh, tequila comes from two breasts. Uh, what they say, which is a volcano in the tequila region. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, oh no, and. Uh, that's one thing I would like to tell you. But before we go into the production, and because tequila is a, really a product of my heart, uh, among many others, because it is so, it's so diverse and it has a big, big history. Uh, but think about tequila like you think about wine, right? You know with wine it is important. What type of grape, right? The terroir, the terroir where it comes from, uh, highlands, lowlands, what altitudes? Uh, what's up with fermentation process? So it's a super diverse category with a lot of bad tequila <laughs> and a lot of good tequila, right? And I'm going to try to, to, to show you the difference. So uh, quick history lesson. I spoke about the Aztecs. The Aztecs was a tribe that uh, believed in many, many gods, and over 10, maybe 20 types of gods. Uh, one of the gods was called uh, Maya Well. And Maya well was the goddess of fertility. Uh, I mean, these, these guys believe so much in, in gods that they make a human sacrifice every day um, because then they thought that the sun would come up the next day as well, uh, which is a little bit funny though. But there was this story that um, one day there was this rainstorm, this big moose on it came over Mexico and a big lightning struck, struck, an, uh, struck an agave the agave that split into two, the agave plant is right there. And actually the juice inside starts fermenting. And then the locals, they start drinking from this agave plant, experiencing the alcoholic effects of the beverage. And they were higher in their, in their minds and they were like, wow, we got, just got signed from the gods and split open the agave. And this but they saw uh, basically the plant as the reincarnation of this goddess of fertility uh, called the uh, Maya Well. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, um, also, the plant is used to make, uh, especially the spiky leaves from the outside of the agave plant, is used to make houses, uh, to make shoes, people use it to make soap, needles. It is a, um, a super diverse plant, which is uh, very important in Mexico. The thing is, actually all around the world, but in Mexico, they did a lot uh, with it. The thing is, you have over 300 different types of agave. And I spoke about mezcal a little bit earlier. Mezcal is the grandfather of, uh, of uh, tequila. Tequila, you can only use one type of agave of all those 300, which had to go seven to 12 years, right? With mezcal, you can use 13 different types of agave, also restricted in different regions. And the production is a little bit different. Um, I'll go more into that in a second. But so for tequila, you see these guys, these guys are called himadors. And the himador, they uh, work super hard, only early morning and late afternoon, because during the day it's too hot. 
uh, they had they hand pick every uh, plant and then they start chopping the, the spikes off. Okay, they do this with a very sharp blade. Uh, you see one of those uh, balls laying in front of uh, in front of them. This looks like actually like a, a pineapple. Uh, it also they call that the piña, the heart of the agave. And this piña is where tequila is made from. This contains a lot of sugars uh, that you can ferment and distill. Uh, the thing is, think of the uh, uh, the piña as a very large potato that you have to boil first, then it becomes soft, it becomes more sweet, and then you're able to squeeze it. They can weigh up to 70 kilos. So it's a pretty hard profession, uh, these guys, but they're getting paid pretty, pretty good. Let's go to the uh, next slide, please. So this piña, uh, we need to cook. We need to put heat into it and um, do this in two different ways. Can we go to the next slide, please? Let me just follow up as well. Yes, sorry, that went too fast. Uh, one, one back. First of all, here we go with cooking traditionally. It was done in a very big gravel pit. Um, first, they made a huge fire. <coughs> Excuse me. They made a huge fire, then uh, placed all the, the piñas, which they would cut in half, on top, covered up blankets, uh, and then a lot of smoke still comes from the wood that uh, is below the agave plant and basically flavoring the agave with smoky flavors. Maybe some of you know uh, how Scotch whiskey is produced. In Scotch whiskey production, uh, where the grain is going to be dried, they do this above a fire and uh, they have peat on top of the fire, which gives releases smoke into the grain. Uh, and that's why flavoring uh, the, the grain with Scotch whiskey. That's why some Scotch whiskey can be very, very smoky. With mezcal, typically, they use this technique. So mezcal is your scotch, basically, of uh, of the agave spirit, which is smoky. If we go to the to the next slide. Then we see uh, a different technique. They call this into uh, this is an autoclave. It's a super big steam pressured uh, cooker, basically. <coughs> steam is forced into the uh, large vessel. The agave gets cooked and everything becomes sweet and moist and uh, ready to be juiced. So next slide, please. Juicing is done traditionally with a big stone wheel, uh, which you find um, uh, in smaller distilleries. They call it that, that squashing wheel, a tahona. Is the next slide already on, guys, or not? No? Oh, no? Could we go to the, to the donkey slide? Uh, donkey slide is on. Okay, then my internet connection is slow. Let me see, let me see. All right, it's not here, no worries. I have the slides here as well, so I'll just uh, say it from here. Uh, one thing again, I, I cannot see the slide, uh, Ono, but uh, I'll be continuing the story. Basically, when you have the agave, when you peel it open after cooking, you have loads of fibers, super, super sweet, and you can really taste the, the sugars in there. Probably you know when you make wine, you take the juice from the grape, which is sweet, start fermenting it so we create alcohol, and that's step number one. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is done, by the way, uh, all big brands, they have automatic presses, and uh, they use the, the fibers from the agave to feed uh, the cattle, basically, or the cattle, the the, the and the sheep, etc. Um Oh no, do we have the next slide on of Polk and Tequila? Yes, we do. Perfect. Um, so Polk basically, ah, yeah, yeah, and now I see it. Very good. Okay, we're all back in business, ladies and gentlemen. And actually here comes the most important step of making tequila. We have those agaves, they grew seven to 12 years, right? Um, cut it down, cut it in half. Start cooking the thing either uh, with tequila into this pressurized steam oven and with mezcal, typically with that smokiness and the earthiness which you get inside. Then pulque is this juice, but then fermented, right? Between four and eight percent alcohol. They still sell it today. You can buy it in cans, which is basically is your agave beer or your agave wine. Then we need to distill, and distilling is done. It's very simple. Is the alcohol evaporates at uh, 73 
uh, degrees Celsius, so a lot sooner than the water uh, evaporates. You take this big vessel that you see in the middle. If you see the word mash, this will be your pulque, which contains four to eight percent alcohol. You heat it up uh, till roughly 73 degrees Celsius. And then uh, when the vapors go up, you collect them and cool them down in the other big reservoir. And you basically get a distillate or a, uh, a concentrated alcoholic component, which left its water behind in the vessel in the middle. If this doesn't make sense, think of rain. When it rains outside, um, you have a puddle of water which evaporates, goes into a big cloud, and with temperature and pressure changes, the cloud starts raining. Uh, that's basically what distilling means. Um, so now we have a clear liquid which is honest. Let's go to the next slide, please. Because we can choose to age uh, the agave spirit. Um, when we're to aging, then there's a lot of things happening in the barrel. Um, I'm not seeing the slide, but I guess it should be up. Um, I think you're going to um, have a few uh, barrels in front of you. What happens in a barrel? Well, let's say this thing here, this little is a barrel. We take our clear liquid, we throw it into the pot and we wait. We wait until color, flavor and aroma starts uh, being infused into the spirit. Think of making a cup of tea. Right? When we make a cup of tea, you use a tea bag, and all of a sudden, uh, or the longer you wait, the darker it gets, and the more flavor you will get. In a barrel, the same thing happens. So, when you have an aged tequila, you'll probably have more wood flavors into it, but also the longer you wait, the more evaporates. Okay? This evaporation is called the angel's share, right? The part for the angels. Um, and basically, uh, what it means is that the product becomes smoother as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide, and that will be your types of tequila. And then we'll do some tasting. I think everybody has uh, their tequilas on the uh, on the table that's, uh, that I asked you for. Let's break this down. And it's nice to write this down as well for everybody. Um, that is the, let's start with the top two. You got Hoven or silver, oro or gold. This is the stuff that probably people will start hugging their toilets with, right? This is the bad stuff most of the time. What we're searching for is this, <coughs> excuse me, this blue agave plant, which is, uh, we have to wait for a very long time. I mean, in the 1960s in America, people get the introduction to the margarita cocktail, which flushed the markets with all this tequila. But you can imagine when you have to wait seven years, for the stock to be restocked, the tequila to be remade. Um, this didn't go really well. So, the, uh, hi, I know you're back again, I see. I you see. Have a question? I have questions. And uh, just like, if I interrupt you in a moment, you don't want to be interrupted, just ignore me, okay, Rob? And uh, that's all fine. Yes, um, sir. Yes, Lauren is asking, what's your favorite tequila to use when making cocktails and why? Is that something you're gonna go back in the tasting or something you want to uh, talk about now already? Um, well, we can uh, let me go to that after I explain you these few categories. Um, is that okay? Yes. And there's another question coming in uh, about the form of the bottle of tequila, like a splash and the bottle is full of jewels. How do I pour this kind of tequila in a glass? And what kind of glass should you use for that if, the, if, the, if it's got a splash bottle, for example? Is that something you're touching base on later as well? A splash bottle? Yes. What is a splash bottle? I, I, I never heard this uh, splash bottle. Uh, it's a bottle full of jewels. Uh, you... Galina, uh, Galina, do you can you like uh, elaborate a little bit more in this chat about the size of the splash bottle so that we uh, know a little bit more what you mean? And in the meantime, Rob, I'll let you do it. We'll come back to this one at the end, Galina, then when we have figured out what the splash bottle is. Okay? Good. Thank you, Rob, for answering. So, well, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and please do uh, interrupt me whenever needed. Um, how are we doing on time, by the way? All good? You are doing Okay, so we've got well. another 25 minutes. Awesome. Um, so let me talk to you really briefly about the types of tequila, then I will go into the uh, how to drink tequila, and then we can go to how to pour it as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so 
I told you about the 1960s, right? The U.S. market got flushed big time with uh, tequila. This was done by a gentleman uh, called uh, Salsa, from, uh, sorry, uh, called um, Jose Cuervo, Don Jose Cuervo. You know probably the name as well. This guy started producing uh, tequila uh, commercially in Mexico. And then uh, Don Salsa introduced the first three barrels of tequila to Texas. And then uh, from that moment on, uh, America was drinking loads and loads of um, uh, tequila. If you look to the cocktail Margarita, we're going to make in a second as well. Uh, can you believe that nowadays, every hour, 180,000 margaritas are being drank or ordered at a bar or at people's houses? So still today, tequila is a big thing. Um, so but what I did to counteract this as this um, this loss in blue agave plants is that they start mixing the tequila up. Oh my God, yes. So that means that 51% of the bottle of tequila that you had at home was made from blue agave. And the other one was made from cheap corn alcohol. This is what we call, ladies and gentlemen, the mixed of tequila. You don't want to serve your guests this, right? especially in our seven-star approach uh, and on the luxury yacht, uh, motor yachts. Um, we do want to have quality tequila. So mixed out tequila is bad, yeah? It's bad for those things. Um, how do you know that you have the good stuff? When you see on the bottle, you see 100% blue agave or 100% Weber tequila or a 100% agave azul. But you see somewhere the 100% on your bottle, then you know that's the good stuff. That's what you want to drink. So, Hoven or Silver, basically, mixed out tequila uh, and Oro or Gold uh, is the same tequila, but then added with caramel and some sugar, right? That's it. No aging. Some silver tequilas could be 100% blue agave, but you have to check the label. With the first step, that's why the line. This is 100% unaged tequila, right? No aging. Just from the still, uh, when you start distilling, it goes into the bottle. Maybe first some mixing with caramel. Set to. That's it. Then you go to Blanco tequila. Blanco tequila has been aged up to two months, right? It's still white. We call that the Blanco or the white uh, tequila, basically. 100% blue agave. Next step is Reposado. The first two letters. Um, tell you that the R and the E, it means it's rested, okay? And the if you go to Añejo, uh, the A means aged. Uh, Reposado means 2 to 12 months of aging in this barrel. So more wood flavors, more oxidization. It becomes a little softer. <coughs> and Añejo, that's from 1 year to 3 years, roughly. So there's more wood flavors. The agave flavors become less and less and less. And eventually you have extra Añejo. Muy Añejo which is three years and older, usually till maximum five years. What do you need on board? Always is the middle three. A 100% blue agave tequilas, you need a blanco, a reposado, and an añejo. If a guest orders a um, tequila with you, the easy thing to say is, okay, sir, would you like a blanco, reposado, or añejo, right? That's the minimum. If you have more tequilas, then probably, um, you need to make tasting notes. And how do you taste tequila, right? Um, well, I, uh, we did a lot of background for me as well as an examinations officer for the WSET, the Wine and Spirits Education Trust. And what we did is we first take yourself a glass and the glass I displayed on the slide as well, uh, an ISO tasting glass or a snifter basically. What's cool about this glass is that the lower part is a little bit wider, top part is more uh, towards the center, so you concentrate the aroma which comes from the tequila, right? I'm just going to pour now a Blanco tequila, which comes uh, from the uh, lowlands. The lowlands meaning low altitude. Yeah, you can see it, very cool. The uh, lowlands meaning a lower altitude. If you look to tea or grapes or coffee, uh, they all share the same thing if you talk about terroir. Uh, tequila is the same thing. When you grow it low, it's hot, it's, you know, it has power, loads of oxygen, loads of heat. So the agave plant can grow a lot faster, so the results in, in heavy flavors. When you take a high altitude tequila, 
it's less oxygen, it's colder, so the plant glow, grows slower, resulting also in a lighter, crisper style of tequila compared to a, to a Lowlands. So Lowlands, Highlands, big, big flavor difference, right? Uh, cool, so let's have a taste. There's no roughly 20 to 30 ml, 30 ml is a lot, 20, 25 ml of the product. Don't start swirling it like a wine glass, okay? It's 38% uh, alcohol, I guess. Yes, 40% alcohol. Uh, tequila needs to have at least 38% alcohol. Uh, that means that there's a loads of aroma coming out, so you don't really need to swirl it. Just take the glass slowly towards the nose and give it a smell. So Lowlands, what do I get? When we smell tequila, I'm also getting peppery, fiery notes. We get some minerals, some earth. So you really, you really can smell already from the aroma that has loads of um, a heavy notes. Then tasting. So the WST approach to tasting as uh, spirits in this case, spirits appearance, <coughs> which is crisp clear. Uh, then aroma. We have an open nose. So that's the second step, which uh, we write down what do we actually get. So we know it's a lowlands, it has loads of power. And then we go to tasting. Tasting is always done in two stages. Step number one, a little bit of tequila to make sure you cleanse the palate, you cleanse the palate, and you get used to the alcoholic content. You wait, you breathe in and out, and then you dive in for your second. Uh, taste this is basically like jumping into a cold pool right the first jump is all oh, cold and you have to get through uh, finally when you're in it's easy to swim or easier to swim same thing with the spirits cool when you taste this try to check for alcohol burn and length breathe in and out and when you breathe in you get that minty feeling on the side or on, on the back of your, um, of your throat like it's proper mint uh, uh, experience the freshness the coldness then you know you're talking about quality tequila as well so breathe in and wait for that mental basically to pop up uh we have a question we have uh, a question um so uh there's a question coming in is the level of alcohol the same across aging is uh is a question Are you good uh, a good question depending on the climate uh, if we look to, let's say, Scottish whiskey, then the angel's share annually is around 3% because it's in a cold climate. Uh, there's not a lot of, and all year around, it's roughly the same temperature. So the part which is evaporating is 3% of the barrel. So the alcohol percentage in the barrel will get lower and lower and lower as well. Uh, when you go to uh, the Caribbean, the angel's share is three times as much because it's that warm uh, and, and the nights are a little bit colder. But in some parts in, let's say, Kentucky, it's so dry that actually the uh, water content will evaporate and the alcohol content will stay in the barrel, uh, which is pretty rare. But in general, you lose alcohol when you age something uh, and sometimes you gain alcoholic strength, but you always lose volume inside the barrel. That's sure. why old products are more expensive, right? Yeah. Another question coming in is saying Any like, other question? yes, that was all good. And then the other question is, so the Blancos, the Repostados and Añejos are the best. Is that is that confirmed? Is that uh, well understood? That the middle well, three are the best? To the origins of tequila. Well, actually, those three are the main categories that people ask for. Um, but what you need to have to have a quality tequila, I mean, it's not nice just that only 51% of your bottle is made from the actual blue agave, right? You want to have the full flavor of this blue agave. So I always say stick with 100% blue agave tequila. Uh, otherwise, you're just being drinking corn alcohol, right? So this doesn't make any sense. And then you have the H statements. And I would always have it available for your uh, for your guests. Yes. Good. And now we're coming back to that Is special. Is that a part. good answer to your question? It's a good answer to the question. Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah. Before I let you continue, we're going back yeah. to that spluch tequila, which is S P L U C H. Um, it is, and there's yeah. been, I've got some private messages on it as well. It is made of solid platinum and wild gold. 
and it was unveiled in Mexico City in October 26, 2006. So it's like uh, they 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 uh, they broke the, uh, the Guinness World Record by selling a bottle for 200,000 euros. And so there's no jewels inside, the jewels on the outside. Wow. So it's a very luxury, it's very used for luxury presents, Galina says. So that's the question. It's like, how do I pour this? It's yeah. like, obviously, it's an expensive bottle and it looks amazing. Okay. Well, to give you an example on how to pour it, uh, I was working in the Amsterdam Hotel for roughly one and a half years to set up the new bar there. And we had one very, very cool cognac called Delamay Le Voyage. And of, uh, one bottle was 5,000 euros only to get in. In Europe, we only had two bottles. One was in Paris, one was in Amsterdam in the hotel. Uh, for 30 milliliters, which was a little bit more than this, we charged the guest in the hotel 485 euros, let's say 500 euros. And one day, an, uh, an Arab uh, came to the bar uh, and he, uh, he ordered uh, the Delamay. So I asked him, oh, you would like the Delamay Le Voyage? He said, would you like a still or would you like a double? <laughs> with nodding on the double, he got went for the double, and then he poured Coca Cola in it. So I was like, "Damn, that's an expensive long drink with Coca Cola for a thousand euros." Um, so you know how to pour spirits. Check with your guests, see what they like. In general, what I would do is I would uh, take the glass, take the bottle at room temperature, both of them, make sure everything is polished and clean, and first pour it at room temperature into uh, a glass similar. To this shape, like the snifter, uh, snifter size. Uh, but the cool thing is, when the guest starts ordering this, or when you're uh, suggesting it to the guest, uh, ask them how would you like to drink it? What type of glass? Do you like any side dishes? Um, would you like me to give you more information on the background? Um, would you like a single or double? Uh, do you do bottle service? So this is the game that we are playing while we're serving guests. So first advice, check everything out with the guests. And the guest is not always right, but they're always guests, uh, as you probably know. Um, and then just play the game and uh, yeah, see uh, see where everything uh, goes from that moment on. If you don't have the time to ask, get yourself a quality, nice, crisp glass, uh, which has a similar shape to this, and then serve it neat, meaning no ice, nothing on the side, uh, on. The bot on the table, uh, room temperature. So that's how I would do it with every spirit, right? Even if it's 10 euros a bottle or uh, 10,000 euros a bottle, I would do exactly the same. So I hope this is an answer to your question. We have another 15 minutes, uh, which is great. So we're actually very good on time. Um, so, how to taste? Use a snifter glass. What type of tequila do you stock? At least 100% low agave tequilas, and then those three categories Blanco, Reposado, Añejo, and Extra Añejo. Let's go to the uh, second last slide, which is how to drink tequila, uh, to drink or not to drink. Uh, probably you see in bars that people take the salt, put the salt on their hands, start licking the salt, uh, taking uh, the uh, shooting down of tequila, and then bite themselves uh, a slice of lime or lemon. Well, they used to do this with uh, medicine. So the doctors back in the old days would give you some salt and some lime or lemon uh, if you had a medicine which is super nasty, super untasty. Uh, you do the same stuff with uh, mixed out tequila or the stuff which is more nasty to hide harsh flavors, right? If you do want to have something like the same ritual, I really would advise you to, to choose orange and cinnamon instead of lime and salt uh, because orange and cinnamon really complements tequila big time in general with good tequila uh, you really do not need the lime and the, sh and the salt um, then you can get straight up we got blanco reposado on yeho in mexico when you have mexican guests uh, typically before dinner they want to drink reposado tequila and after dinner as digestive they go for the añejo tequila um, so that question, and then obviously in a mixed drink, we are going to make the margarita or a, a, well, a variation on this. So more about that in a second. You got the uh, Bloody Mary variation called the Bloody Maria, right? With tequila, super tasty. You can add instead of lemon juice in the Bloody Maria, you put a lime juice, put some fresh coriander in there, 
and you can make it as crazy if you want, but let's like, make, make this Mexican twist. Then the Paloma, which we made, I hope everybody uh, has already finished that drink uh, in this early <laughs> time of the day, um, because we're going to move on to the next one. Then the one we all know, the Tequila Sunrise, which is uh, tequila, peach snaps, uh, grenadine, and orange juice. Again, there are thousands of recipes, uh, but it's, yeah, it's a, a, a cruise ship boat, uh, a cruise ship cocktail, as they call it, uh, but very, very popular. Then Sangrita. Sangrita is the next, that's how they drink it in Mexico. You got the glass of uh, aged tequila, um, and then they take orange juice, hot sauce, some salt, and um, uh, drink that as a chaser, basically. So on the side of your um, tequila, you drink that as a chaser. But do swap around the green. Maybe you've heard of the old fashioned cocktail, which is a base spirit, uh, bitters and sugar. If you take tequila and you add some bitters and some sugar, my God, you're such a nice tasting drink as well. Uh, but let's put this into perspective. We have another 10 minutes on our clock, so let's go to the next slide. And I would like everybody to prepare uh, the tools. Let me, I'm going to make some space on the bar, and then I'm going to need three minutes just to explain you what's standing on the left of the slide. Make some space here. There you go. Okay, on the left side of this slide, we got the first three steps. If we talk about mixology, taste, sensation, and aroma. This is how the human body tastes or registers flavor. Taste is everything on the tongue. Five flavors. Sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. Umami is a savory flavor. Um, step number two, what do we register in the mouth? Sensations, right? This is texture in a drink, this is temperature, and that's pain. Do we all have a glass of tequila? Uh, let's, let's pour yourself another glass of tequila. Yeah, hey, we're here anyways. Pour yourself a little bit of tequila, take that sip, uh, and I would like you to check for the alcoholic content. This is what we call pain. There's a receptor in the mouth called the terminal pain reflex, and this registers pain um, but because of this pain sensation, sometimes it's hard to taste all the aroma components which is into the glass. Uh, so by lowering the alcohol percentage, uh, you're lowering the pain as well in a good cocktail uh, and making space for all those flavors to really shine uh, in the drink. Uh, last but not least, aroma. This is registered in your nasal cavity, meaning that the drink should smell good, but everything that I didn't spoke about and that's actually all the flavors you see on the outside of your screen as well, uh, like cucumber, kumquat, cinnamon, ginger. This is registered, ladies and gentlemen, 100% in the nose, okay? Because taste and sensation is in the mouth, but the, ar the, uh, the aromatics, basically, is in the nose. So taking these three steps in perspective while making drink, super important. Then the next three steps, balance. We have different types of balance, sweet and sour, Bitter and sweet is what we see in cocktails. If you make a drink which is too sour, um, or too, let's say too sweet, most of the times drinks are too sweet, then uh, your taste buds will be overloaded with that sweetness, and after a while you will not taste anything anymore, making the drink experience uh, rather yeah, bad, right? You want to have an optimum drinking experience, so you want to keep those taste buds registering flavor and leave, leave, keep them alive. Uh, and you do this by balancing a cocktail. Next step is dilution. I explained you this, lower alcohol, lowering alcohol percentage by adding soda or shaking with ice, uh, essential for a good cocktail. And then synergy, synergy between ingredients, either amplifying hidden flavors or complementing flavors with the ingredients you add. You all have um, extra ingredients. The drink we're going to make now uh, is the uh, margarita. I'm going to show you my variation of it, and I'll explain you all the different steps. So you can follow me as well. So let's go back to the big screen, um, and I will show you on how to make it. You have your cocktail shaker probably. Two parts. First one part, we put the tequila. Tequila, we're going to add 60 ml. I'm going to use uh, Reposada tequila for this one. I just want to have some more. Uh, woody notes will be a little softer and smoother. Drink 60 milliliters. 
when you're going to shake a cocktail, make sure you add three ingredients first and then the ice. If I now first add my ice, um, it starts me it starts, starts melting. I'm going to have a lot of melting water in my drink, which I do want, but not too much. So if you want to control this, we add ice last. Tequila is in. Next up is lime. This is a uh, fresh lime. And you're going to cut it in half and give it a good squeeze into the jigger. I think you already have it prepared. It's 30 milliliters of lime juice. And you don't have to do it now necessarily, but I'll show you a cool trick because aroma components is very important. So I'm using the skin of the lime, the peel, to uh, shake also uh, with the whole liquid because of the ice will start smashing against the peel, releasing a lot of those essential oils and making the drink a lot more interesting. Uh, so that's just a tip that you can use. Lime juice is in there. Sweetness comes from uh, orange liqueur, which I'm going to get. Give me a second. And the orange liqueur basically is, uh, in this case, it's a triple sec. You might want to use Cointreau or any other type of triple sec that you want, but it should be clear. It should be distilled orange spirit, basically. And a liqueur, by European regulations, is that you have at least 100 grams sugar per liter in it and at least 15 personnel. Right? So that's a liqueur. We use this as our sweetener that goes in there. Very nice. 30 minutes. Before I start shaking it, I would like everybody to taste it, right? Because now we have a sweet and a sour, which is in a drink. Check. Okay, that's done. We have the spirit in there, but it's still strong. So give a quick taste. How it tastes when it's not shaken properly or not shaken at all. Okay, in the meantime, I'm just going to get myself a glass. Give me a second. And I would like you to pre-chill your glass as well. A cocktail glass or a coop. In this case, I just leave it on the side so it gets nice and cold. And then it's time to shake. Um, officially, we're going to shake it, but I'm going to shake it with a little touch, okay? When we look to mixology, amplifying hidden flavor, this is still the moment to add your flavors in. With soft ingredients, just chuck them into the shaker and shake them with basil leaves or mint or strawberries or raspberries. If you have something else <clears throat> like grapefruit, get some chunks in there and then start muddling, start crushing it into the shaker before you finish it into the glass. So I would like to take the classic recipe of the 60 ml, 30 ml, 30 ml, and you can add your ingredients on top of that, right? The strawberry margarita basically is this recipe but then add it with extra strawberry flavors. Usually it's syrup and fresh uh, strawberry, um, but that's the thing. So I'm going to shake it. After shaking, uh, sorry, before shaking, I'm going to charge it with some smoke. So we're going to go back to this roots of um, what mezcal used to be. This is a smoker. You see smoke coming out right here. I'm going to collect the smoke into the shaker. Leave that for a side. And then close it off with some ice as well. You see that? Get some more smoke in there and then close it off. There you go. Take it away. The smoke is trapped into the shaker. You don't to the food. Okay. Make sure to smile while you're shaking. Smoke is trapped into the glass. Good eight to ten seconds shaking. Depending on the type of shake you have, just give the top of this two-part shaker a small tap and it opens up. Yeah. Quick taste before we serve. It smells super nice in here. Um check it for that balance. This is super. Get the ice out. Put it in front of the obviously with the napkin. There you go. Strain this godliness juice into the glass, respecting our goddess of fertility, Maya Well, with this reposado margarita, which has been uh, smoked. I'm just going to garnish it with a simple lime peel. We all know how to make a wheel. It's a simple round slice. 
just like that on the side keeping it simple and just serve it like that if you feel like it you can add some salt as well the salt rim just take the line rub it around the rim and then you dip the glass in the salt stick uh, but this is my version of a classic drink uh, called the margarita um, if you're going to make your own variation remember just to keep the guidelines uh, right of the taste sensation and aroma you want to tickle all the senses then if we talk about the basics of mixology your dilution your balance into the cocktail um, and when you start playing with ingredients think of synergy look to the kitchen and be inspired by that uh, for now that's it for this drink probably you're making it as i'm talking uh, but i actually have to one more last slide and then i'm out of um, material for now but let's go to the next slide please uh ono i'm just going to do a quick recap on what we've done in this hour basically is um the key elements of mixed drinks so those seven rules on ice glass on correct garnishes brands uh, correct technique uh, super essential then the second one is the introduction to tequila. When we talk about tequila, remember blue agave and preferably 100% blue agave. Please do stock in your uh, spirit uh, room or your wine room. Make sure you have at least a Blanco, a Reposado, an Añejo tequila, 100% blue agave. Um, I spoke about this strange thing called mezcal um which we, will, we can still talk about we'll get your email addresses and we'll send you a small information package as well and what we spoke uh, about uh but metal typically smoky yeah uh, and it's made from 13 different types of agave depending on the, 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 the distillery um and tequila only from one which is not smoky mixology guidelines i just spoke about it um what i would like to say and it's also on the last slide let's go one slide further oh no i don't see any slides in my screen but maybe it's my system um on behalf of a crew and on behalf of luxury hospitality uh thank you so much for joining this session and uh, i would do love to still answer some questions if we have yes there is on our back the screen um, yes, I'm taking any screen. questions uh oh, yes, no. I'm taking sorry yeah, yeah well, there's not there's not a lot i i think people are basically still overwhelmed by um well people are looking forward to drinking <laughs> yum looks delicious so thirsty yes. so i think that's a good response uh question that i will answer is will this be recorded yes and we'll have it online later today so everybody who didn't manage to do the live session they can repeat it later so uh that's good um fabulous information there that this was such a great lesson so interesting fun and interactive uh if we could do more on other spirit it would be wonderful but maybe like end of for everybody who's listening like we'll be back with more webinars later this month so this is definitely not the last time that rob will be with us i think we'll do a lot of a uh, session valimir is thanking you uh, lillian is thanking you i think everybody's basically thanking you and um uh, well and now you're making me jealous and uh, enjoy your tequila i think this is a great <laughs> question <laughs> thank you so much rob hope that you'll be back <laughs> soon everybody it's going to be online later yes. today so you can look it back stay, get in touch with them if you want more information and be and be tuned in this afternoon for our last webinar oh there is one question that i, I forgot I have one more thing oh yeah yeah there's one question i forgot Galina, yeah, so just a quick thing, uh, you go for it yeah okay, let, i'll just go for it yeah thanks um for everybody obviously who is joining us right now uh, the PowerPoint presentation that I use for this uh, webinar, we will be sending this to you. So also, if you have questions afterwards, you can contact us. Uh, also, we'll do a quick questionnaire. We'll send you a questionnaire on uh, these kinds of webinars and what you find interesting so we can improve for the future. Or uh, if you have other requests, uh, let us know in this uh, enquête. Actually, it's a feedback form, basically. So we'll send you this. Uh, you will receive this in your email this week. Great. So Galina asked earlier, and I forgot to tell you this question, uh, is tequila sensitive to light, as some bottles have to be kept in wooden boxes? 
Well, actually, all spirits, they have uh, three things or, uh, yes, three things which is uh, very bad for your product. First of all, oxidization. When you have a bottle which instead of have a little bit left in it, either drink it as fast as possible or um, put it into a smaller container. So oxidization will ruin a lot of the flavors of the product. Second is heat. Okay, when it becomes warm, it's in it. It, it um, stimulates the oxidization, but it also changes the product, especially when you talk about cures with fresh juices. And then the sunlight contains UV radiation. Uh, so UV radiation is also bad for your products. In this case, when you have a clear spirit, it's pure alcohol, not a lot of fresh ingredients in there. Um, if you just store it closed, you would be fine. I don't hear a lot of stories on a new or a full bottle uh, in the sun. Uh, that is, is really ruining the, 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 the flavor or the, the quality, basically. But in general, yes, sunlight, heat, and oxidization, keep that as low as possible. And on that note, I thank you very much, Rob, and I hope to see you soon again for more sessions with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Absolutely. Bye-bye, and uh, see you later today. See you, thank you. at the other time. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining. Cheers.